So we're just going to finish talking about the travel cost method. This video is going to be about hedonic pricing. You'll recall that both the travel cost method and hedonic pricing are revealed preference methods, which means we don't well, I was going to say, we don't ask people what they do. I mean, the travel cost method is a survey, but we're not asking people a hypothetical question. We're asking people a uh, factual question, how much money did they pay in order to travel to the park? So in, in theory, we wouldn't actually even have to ask if we had some other way of, let's say, credit card uh, records to determine how much they they spent on the trip. So the point is that both the travel cost method and what we're going to just about to talk about hedonic pricing is, is based on absurd behave, behavior. It uses data based on actual behavior. There's nothing hypothetical about it. Whereas the express preference method that's that we'll deal with in a different video is about a hypothetical question. Now hedonic pricing is a little hard to describe, so I'm going to use an example and then generalize the example later. The example is real estate, in particular house prices. Let's suppose that one of the things that affects the price of a house is whether it has a good view or not. And suppose you were trying to, suppose an economist were trying to come up with an example of an equation for the price of a house. This would be some function of a lot of characteristics of so this dot 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 means a lot of house characteristics like the size of the house, the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, the age of the house, its location, how large the lot size is, so forth, things like this. And also the environment, in particular whether it has a view. Now one way to to do this would be for the economist to gather a lot of data and then to use a statistical tool called econometrics to the verb is to estimate an equation a, a simple version would be this kind of equation that would equal the price of the house or that would predict, perhaps would be a better word, the price of the house. <clears throat> For example, suppose you had data on house prices over the last two years, and also the house size in square foot, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, age, and view or not. So you have a data set with a whole bunch of house prices and for each house you have the size, the number of bedrooms, and so forth. Econometrics is a statistical tool that lets an economist or any kind of appraiser use this sort of data set to come up with an equation that most closely predicts what the house price is going to be given these other variables. So the result of an econometric exercise might be something like house price equals, uh, now I'm just making up completely hypothetical numbers you know, equals um, 300 times the size plus um, 100,000 times the number of bedrooms plus 50,000 times the number of bathrooms plus uh, I don't know, 100 times the age. No, we would want minus 100 times the age, because age is a, uh, in, in lots of cases, age is a bad thing, not a good thing. And then, uh, l 
let's say, plus two times a variable called view, which maybe goes from zero to a thousand, depending on if there's no view at all versus if there's an absolutely fantastic view. So this is an example of this kind of functional form. Now you might ask, why does it take that functional form? Couldn't it be a much more complicated function than just this? And the answer is yes, it certainly could be. And econometricians do sometimes deal with more complicated functions. But <coughs> appraisers don't. Uh, appraisers just uh, deal with uh, these kind of functions. And the Utah legislature passed the law probably, I don't remember when it was, probably around 2010 which said that property taxes in the state of Utah have to be based on the value of the home calculated in this kind of way. So every county assessor's office in Utah has to use this kind of technique and derive this kind of formula using, using recent data in order to set the value of the house for tax purposes because every year you have to pay property taxes based on the value of the property. So it's not only academic economists that use this. Now again, the functional form, you know, maybe there's a better functional form that involves, I don't know, sines and cosines or exponentials or something like that, but there are an infinite number of functional forms you can use. Uh, typically, e uh, economists deal with this kind of linear functional form. Now, speaking about the environment, once we have used the data to get this equation, then the coefficient here tells us the value of the view. You know, if Again, if the view was an index from 0 to 1,000, then in this case, if the index went from 100 to 101, the house price would go up by 2. Now, I don't know if that's $2 or $2,000. Yeah, it depends on the units. But, but this would be a way of getting a valuation for a good view. You would be essentially be inferring from people's actual behavior how much money they paid to get a good view. Because once you have this equation, you can imagine two houses that have ident the identical size, identical bedrooms, identical bathrooms, identical age, but differ in view. And if they differ in view, then they're going to differ in house price. And this number two uh, tells you the relationship between how they differ in view and how they differ in house price. So that's the basic idea of hedonic pricing. <coughs> now, let me go to the problems first and then I'll discuss what I haven't discussed yet, this business here of, of labor. It, you can use hedonic pricing for situations besides real estate, but real estate is the most common application of hedonic pricing. Okay, so let me talk about the problems first. So problem number one, lack of data. In the real estate industry, they call houses comparables if they are close to each other in size, age, location, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, and so forth. And if you don't have a lot of comparables, then you're trying to infer the, the the value of a house given houses that aren't aren't a very close match, and so the quality of the what a composition is called the estimation is going to be poor, and so you're going to have less confidence in this equation. So this this equation is I don't want to say it's a guess. But it's a statistical estimate. It's certainly not perfect. And depending on whether you have a lot of data and whether the data includes houses that are pretty similar to the house you're trying to value, you can have more or less confidence that the equation is close to correct in the sense that if you feed it size, 
number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, age, and view, it tells you the correct house price. There's going to be an error term, and the question is how big that that error term is. And if you don't have a lot of data, you're probably going to have big error terms. Okay. So that was problem number one. Problem number two is difficult to use. You you have to use a statistical software package. Now, for econometricians, this is what they do every day, and so it's second nature. But for most people, this is a pretty hard thing to understand. Okay, so that's uh, that's the second problem. Now let me go back and talk about the fact that you can use hedonic pricing uh, when you're not talking about real estate. And again, since hedonic pricing is kind of difficult, I'm just going to use an example, another example. The example that I'm going to use is labor. It could be hourly wage. <coughs> it could be uh, annual salary. And I'm going to claim that so this is the price of labor, let's say hourly wage, is a function of a whole bunch of stuff and also the environment of the job. Now that could be the natural environment, like are you working in polluted or noisy conditions? But it could also be the social environment. Is it a job in a high crime area? Is it a job that exposes you to a lot of danger? Or is it a very safe job where there's essentially no crime? So the notion would be you're trying to figure out how much people value safety or how much more you have to pay them if you're offering them a more dangerous job. And this, of course, can be continuous. If it's slightly more dangerous, you only have to pay them a little bit more. If it's medium more dangerous, you have to pay them even more. If it's extremely dangerous, you have to pay them even more. And you're trying to figure out what is the relationship between the environmental variable, whether it's the danger of the job or how polluted the work environment is, the, the relationship between that and the wage rate. So what you would do is you would collect data on on wage rates in different industries and let me just use the word environment here if you were interested in crime then the maybe the variable you use for the environment would be the crime rate or the number of crimes that occur in this industry in a year year if you are interested in the air quality in the workplace, then you'd use some measure of of indoor air quality there. And, and, and so you have this data on, on different occupations, their wages and their environment. And then other and then the other things that affect wages like the uh, like how many years of e e education you need in order to do the job, so the education requirements, um, experience, uh, the more experienced somebody is, the the higher the wage that's paid. Maybe the uh, the management level. Is it? Uh, are you not a managerial employee at all? Are you a low level manager? Are you a mid level manager? So each one of these observations is a wage, the environment, and then education, experience, management level, and other kinds of things. And then you would the econometrician would come up with an equation that would say that the wages equal some mathematical formula depending on the environment and all the other things education experience and so forth and then the economist could look at the relationship between environment and wages and see how much yeah you know, how much wages have to go up if you're trying to hire somebody for a job that has a high risk of death for example so 
or or a job that um, that is quite likely to cause damages to the person's health in the long run, like coal mining and uh, black lung disease, which is which is uh, an occupational hazard that lots of coal miners suffer when when they get to be older and they've worked in the coal mines for many decades. So this is another example of the hedonic pricing method. And it's not about houses, it's about it's about labor. So so that's the way the, the, the method works. As I said, it is it is difficult to use, but it has the advantage of using real world data and attempting to calculate how much people in in the real life are actually how much they're willing to pay for a house that has a better environment and how much they're going to demand in terms of wages for a job that's more dangerous or dirtier there are other applications besides houses and labor but I think I'll just leave it at that so that's all we're going to say about hedonic pricing the next video is going to talk about contingent valuation and contingent valuation is a very commonly used technique, and we're going to have a lot to say about that.